All right, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 24, Paul tells them that they can no longer live as the Gentiles live, as those who've turned their backs on God, who don't think about Him, don't care about Him, who have, no longer have an awareness of Him, they can't live that way. On the contrary, they are to live, uh, live new lives of righteousness and holiness. So we don't apologize for that as Christians. We don't sit here and say, well, that makes me like a yes, no, I think I'm better than you. No, we are striving to live new lives of righteousness and holiness. We recognize we fail to do that perfectly, but we are serious about the pursuit of righteousness and holiness. In 425 through 52, Paul exhorts them, and the Spirit of God is exhorting us through what Paul said to them exhorts them to put off falsehood and to speak the truth to other members of the body, to deal swiftly with their righteous anger, not to steal but to work hard so as to have material things to share with others, not to speak harmful words but words that build others up, to do away with bitterness, wrath, anger, shouting, slander, and malice, this kind of hostility within the community, all of that to be done away with. God tells us those things are to be put away, done away with serious. So he's exhorting them to put those things away. He exhorts them to be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to one another. He exhorts them to be imitators of God specifically with regard to loving one another. Be like God in that way. Okay, the ground and model for that being Christ's love and sacrificial offering for himself. And when we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 5, verses 3 through 14. As I always do, I want to pick back up there. I will repeat some of what I said, uh, say a bit more about that section, and then we will move on. All right, 5, 3 through 14, he says, But do not let sexual immorality and any impurity or greed even be named among you as is fitting for saints, nor obscene speech, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are not proper, but rather thanksgiving. For this you must know for sure, no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be sharers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, ascertaining what is pleasing to the Lord, and do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even expose them. For it is shameful even to mention the things being done by them in secret. But everything exposed is made visible by the light, for everything that makes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, sleeping one, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, Paul, he says that sexual immorality, any impurity and greed are not even to be named among them. Now, I talked about that uh, last week. Not even to be be named among them. And as, as I said, I think what he means is that it shouldn't become acceptable subjects of conversation. Nor is their conversation to contain obscene speech, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which as Peter O'Brien notes, these are all terms that refer to a dirty mind expressing itself in vulgar conversation. Okay, so, you know, sometimes you have people say, oh yeah, I love the Lord Jesus, and they, they, they talk just filthy. And somebody needs to say to them, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. Oh, what do you care, it's just words? No, it's not right. Okay, and so he tells them, he tells them that. Then he flatly declares in verse 5 that no sexually immoral or impure sexually impure or greedy, and that's it, greedy almost certainly referring again to in some kind of sexual sense, no sexually impure, I mean no sexually immoral, sexually impure, or sexually greedy person has an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. He just tells them that. Okay, flat out, the sexually immoral person must repent to gain, to receive an inheritance. So we don't do people favors when we say to the sexually immoral person, when we want them to, no, that's okay. Oh, you know, that's fine. You continue living that way, and that'll be fine. Well, you're lying to them. You see, you're lying to them. 
No sexually immoral person, a person who is saying, listen, this is how I'm going to live, has an inheritance. So we have to tell one another, you have to stop that. You have to get out of that. Okay, so he's telling them there, just, he just flat tells them no sexually immoral person has an inheritance. Then in, in verse 6 here, he urges them not to let anyone deceive them into thinking they can live in sexual sin and avoid the wrath of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Every culture has the voices that tell people. Don't listen to what I just said. I just said what Paul said in verse 5, no sexually immoral person will inherit the kingdom. Okay, a person says, listen, I don't care what you say. I'm going to keep living with my girlfriend. I'm going to be in a homosexual relationship. I'm going to do it. Well, we think, well, I want to be compassionate toward the person, and I want them to say, you know, that's fine. You're not being compassionate. You're reinforcing them. You're being in, what, what, what do we call in other contexts? You're enabling them to hurt themselves. True love will bear their resentment and their anger and say, listen, you may get mad at me, but I'm telling you the truth. You see, I'm telling you the truth, that this is wrong. And he says, let no one deceive you with empty words because every culture, every society has voices that tell you, listen, that's crazy, don't worry about that. You can live in any kind of sexual and moral relationship you want to live in, and you're okay. Now you tell me, our society is taking that to an art form. Okay, just to an art form. Everything telling you. Anybody who says, wait a minute, no, there is such a thing as sexual immorality and it's serious business. Oh, you're, you know, you got problems. Why are you trying to stick your nose in somebody else's business? I'm trying to help them. You see? Because it is somebody else's business, it's God's business. And you're trying to help them. Okay, but we've got that, you know, we're, we've made this, it, taken it to an art form. He says, because of the dire consequences, they must not join with the disobedient. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be sharers with them. Christian, person born of God, have no part in this. Okay, you have to stay away from this. Don't be sharers with them. In addition, they must not join, join in with the disobedient because they've been changed by becoming Christians. Okay, we've been changed by becoming Christians. We pass from darkness into the light of being in the Lord, and we should act accordingly. We're not the way we were. We used to live over here. This is how we used to be, but we saw the truth of Jesus Christ. We became His, and we have been transferred from darkness into light. So we now are to live according to that. Living as children of light, that involves exhibiting goodness, righteousness, and truth. Again, do, you know, do we do it, sit here and say, well, do we do it smugly? Oh, you know, that I don't, I don't engage in those kinds of things, so you're a dirtbag and I'm not. Is that, no, what are we trying to, we're trying to honor God in how we live. So we don't then sit and say, well, I don't think I should try to be that way because it might make other people uncomfortable. They think, who are you, Holy Joe? Well, whatever you think of me, I want to honor God in how I live, Right? So that's what he's saying. Look, you are to live as children of light. You're to exhibit goodness, righteousness, and truth. Ascertaining what is pleasing to the Lord. That's what's involved in in living as children of light. Not participating in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather exposing those works as evil. Exposing those works as evil. We don't like that. We don't like the idea of exposing sin as sin. Evil is evil. We'd rather just kind of, can't, you know, can't we just ignore all that stuff? But he's telling them that part of living as children of light involves ex- in sp- exposing uh, sinful works, the unfruitful works of darkness, exposing those things as evil. Indeed, he says, it's, it's shameful even to mention the things, no doubt talking about sexual sins, being done by the godless in secret. And who can doubt that in this day? Right? I mean, what, what happens when we hear about Tiger Woods? Okay, I mean, you know, what's being done? What's being done that you in secret? I'd hate to peek in, into the rooms of these Hollywood people. Right? I mean, they look at you and say, what are you, you, you just are all hung up. I said, no, you, you guys are reprobates. And you're trying to convince the, you're doing nothing but preaching nonstop. 
that this is how people ought to live. And if anybody dares to say, no, you're wrong, then you throw stones at them and say, well, look, you're not entitled to think that. You're not entitled to think that. You're a religious nut. You've got problems, blah, blah, blah. The whole time they're just preaching. It's a nice game. See if you can get it. You set the stage that way. So that anybody that says something against you, he's not allowed to talk. He's written off immediately. And this is what they're doing. But he says here about shameful even to mention the things being done by the godless in secret. It is light in the form of godly living that he's just described. Okay, we are to live as children of light, goodness, righteousness, truth. That is how we're to be as Christians. Okay? And don't shy away from it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't say, well, I, I can't say those things. I can't try to be those things because I fail. I know you fail. God knows you fail. But don't let that cause you to surrender the goal. You see? And to say, okay, well, I'm no longer even going to talk about that or strive for that or anything or be serious because I fall short of it. So no. You set your sights on that and you pursue it and you proclaim it and you tell other people this is how we are to be. Okay, we are to live this way. Now it's light in the form of that kind of godly living that exposes, that makes visible works of darkness by presenting a righteous standard for comparison. That is how you expose darkness. You live righteous lives. And the people see. Okay, here we have, here is, here is a person living this way, and that's part of why they jump on you. It is because a holy life convicts the sinner. You don't have to get in their face. You simply say, you know, if something's happening, no, no I'm not going to do that. I remember when I became a Christian, the people who pressured me and tried to get me to go drinking with them was amazing. No, 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 you, come on, man. You just come, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And their interest in getting me to do it was just really amazing. You see? So just by saying, no, I'm, you know, I, I know all about getting drunk, and I'm not going to go hang out there. I'm not going to do that. That's why they're, see, if you live righteously, they attack you because the very fact of living that way exposes what they're doing. Now, he says here in, uh, you know, light in the form of godly living, it exposes these things. That, that's what we're talking about. Then the meaning down here of, of the first part of verse 14, where 13, he says, but everything exposed is made visible by the light. For everything that makes visible is light. Now, I take a, uh, against nearly all commentators and most uh, all the new translations, I side with the uh, King James and the New King James in, in understanding this verb here as a middle instead of a passive. You know, a lot of the translations will say everything that is made visible is light. Okay, but you can take it and understand there's everything that makes visible. I hate to tell you how many hours I spent messing with that, trying to understand it as a passive, and I just couldn't make what I thought adequate sense of it. So I think the idea he's saying is that everything that, that he's supporting his statement that it's light that makes visible the works of darkness that he says in verse 13 by noting indirectly that making things visible is the essence of light. Through your righteous living, you give a standard that exposes the deeds of darkness. And he's saying that is light because whatever makes visible has the essence of light, which is making things visible. Okay, so that's what I think he's talking about. Everything that makes things visible is light in the sense that it's, that it's, uh, that's light's essence. Okay, but as I say, this is a notoriously uh, difficult little deal there. All right, so there you have my two cents on that. Now, that revealing function of light is what's behind this probable baptismal hymn here where he says, therefore it says, given the revealing function of light, that's why it says in this baptismal hymn that they probably knew about, Awake, sleeping one, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See, those who were baptized into Christ, this hymn would be part of that, what was going on there. They would sing this at the time. The person who's baptized into Christ, they pass from spiritual death to spiritual life, from alienation to reconciliation, and they'll have the Lord's light constantly revealing the truth to them, especially the truth about themselves. And I kind of like this idea that as you become a Christian, the new life is lived in the exposing light of Christ. Isn't that where we live our lives? You went from here, you were over here in the darkness, now you've come into the light and Christ 
light is exposing in your life as you continue to live. He's there shining in all the shadows in your life. And he's chipping away and making you daily more into his image. Okay, so I see this idea. That's what I think is going on there where he says, he cites this probable baptismal hymn where he says, Therefore, it says, given the revealing function of light, awake sleeping one and rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. He will, you will live your life in the exposing light of Christ when you pass through the waters of baptism and are his. You see, having passed from death to life. So I think that's what he's, what he's saying there. 5, 15 to 20. He says, watch carefully, therefore, how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one, other, one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music to the Lord with your hearts, always giving thanks to God the Father for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of the importance of holy living and the danger of deception he's talking about, he says, listen, no sexually immoral person is going to have an inheritance. Let nobody deceive you with empty words. Don't listen to the voices that come around in every society and culture and say, Psst, don't listen to that, that's crazy. You go ahead and live the way you want to and it'll be fine. Because of the importance of that, okay, of holy living and the danger of deception, Paul urges them to, to take care to conduct themselves as wise people, as those who have insight into the true nature of things, especially God's gracious purposes in Jesus Christ. Live that way. Live as people who have insight into what's really going on, into the true nature of things, into God's gracious purposes in Christ. See, the wise are those who walk worthily, worthily of the calling to which they've been called, as he mentions in chapter 4, verse 1. He urges them to do that. That's a wise person, and to do so requires insight into the Lord's will, which he says in, in verse 15. See, that they are to have insight into the Lord's will. Living wisely, it includes having a right attitude toward the opportunities that time offers, making the most of the time... Because the days are evil. Because we live in the midst of evil, who can deny it? Right? But we're not new in that way, right? This is a fallen world, a dark world. We live in the midst of evil. And because we live in the midst of evil, it's even more important that we take every opportunity to let our light shine. Making the most of opportunities, using the time wisely. Light is precious in this world, and our ray of light may be the only ray that somebody sees. So as we are out in the world, we are to do what? We are to take advantage of the opportunities we have, letting our light shine in the darkness. We are an influence on the world. And so it's important that we do that and understand that. To do so requires insight into the Lord's will, as he's mentioned. See, we need to have some grasp of that. Uh, light is precious. Okay, it is precious and we need to let our shine in the world. Living as Christians, setting that standard, drawing people, enlightening them, letting them see. This, you know, we got people in the world here that they have no idea. They grow up thinking, hey, all of this stuff is fine. So no, it's, it's not. Well, why don't you do that? What's your beef with that? Ah, then you have opportunities, hopefully, to, to express it. Because wise or godly living <clears throat> is so important for us and others. Christians cannot afford to be foolish. We have to understand what the will of the Lord is. See, this is where some effort expended, some uh, work involved in understanding what the will of the Lord is. You don't just get baptized and then just go on vacation. You know, that's it. You have to expend some effort to understand, well, how is, what is God's viewpoint on things? Because I'm telling you, it's opposite the world. And you float around in this world and you think you understand what God wants. And our big thing is, well, God wants me to be happy. That becomes the thing. He wants, me, he wants you to be faithful. He wants you to be good. Okay? That may lead you to a beating. You won't be too happy about that, though. But it may lead you that way. You see, so, I mean, we have to understand what the, what the will of the Lord is. That's important. 
And that's the heart of genuine wisdom. It's not right to be apathetic toward the will of God. Okay? It's just not right for a Christian to sit here and say, listen, I don't care. I don't want to do that. I don't want to study. I don't want to come to Bible study. I don't want to study the Bible at home. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to be dunked in the water, be okay, and then bop off. That's not right. You see? That's not right. It is important to understand what the will of the Lord is. Instead of the foolish pagan practice of getting drunk on wine, something that leads to debauchery, and any of you who've been in that world, you understand. Look, you know, I, I've said before when we teach on Proverbs, there, there's no idea of the true social cost of drunkenness. You know, it leads to all kinds of things. It leads to just, you know, when he says leads to debauchery, of course it does. It breaks down people's sense, their inhibitions, their understanding, gives them this idea, you know, hey, let's just do anything. You know, how many robberies and stuff people are, are totaled? They don't care. They just go, yeah, I think I'll go in here and just rob this place. If he was sober, he wouldn't do it. Okay, but he says, he says it leads to debauchery. He says, instead of that foolish practice, see, of getting drunk on wine that leads to debauchery, they're to engage in the wise counterpart. See, you're to be wise people. Instead of this, you're to engage in the wise counterpart of being filled with or by the Spirit. You have to note that being filled with or by the Spirit is something a person can be commanded to do. He tells them, you're to be filled with or by the Spirit. One can surrender one's will to what the Spirit wants done in one's life, one can increasingly give oneself over to the Spirit's desire. You have something to do in this. You can be commanded. We have the idea, of, you know, out there in the religious world, is that being filled with the Spirit is, just, you know, I'm just sitting here and all of a sudden I just run around crazy or, you know, this kind of stuff. That I have, you know, I'm just sitting here and all of a sudden I just start vibrating or something. You understand, you have a role to play in surrendering to what the Spirit wants done in your life. Now, whether you understand the preposition is with, whether you understand it is in, being filled with, I mean, with or by, the preposition is in, but whether you understand, en, uh, epsilon nu, it's, uh, uh, whether you understand that preposition to mean with or by, I think O'Brien here, he captures the meaning of being filled with the Spirit. He says, believers are the recipients of the exhortation at 518, for although we do not fill ourselves, right, we're not the ones filling, but we have a role to play. You see, we quit slapping the hands. We open up. All right, he says, for although we do not fill ourselves, we are to be receptive to the Spirit's transforming work, making us into the likeness that is the fullness of God and Christ. We are to be subject to the Spirit's control, which is tantamount to letting Christ's word rule in our lives, Colossians 3.16, so that we may walk wisely, Ephesians 5.15, and understand more fully the Lord's will, verse 17. The goal is to attain to what in principle we already have in Christ, fullness and spiritual maturity. So he's telling them, he, he tells them, listen, you are to be filled with or by the Spirit. You are to open yourself to the Spirit's transforming work. Unlike these pagans who are getting drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, you're not to, you're not to be engaged in that. They're being filled, spirit-filled. It leads not to debauchery, as the pagans being filled with wine, but to their speaking to each other in religious songs, when in their gatherings they sing and make music to the Lord from their hearts, giving thanks then and always to God the Father for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the contrast? Do you see the gatherings of pagans as alcohol-fueled exercises in debasement? Now, what are the gatherings of the saints? They are these spirit-transformed hearts to the glory of God. See, we are here speaking, expressing ourselves in these, in, in these songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and Nearly everybody acknowledges these are synonymous. These are the three main ways of referring to religious songs in the Septuagint. So what are we doing as we gather? Spirit-filled people. We are singing these religious songs, expressing praise and glory to God. You know, it's not two separate things, by the way, as O'Brien points out. It's not like speaking in songs and singing as though these are two different things. They're, they're the same thing from different aspects. 
He's talking about our singing. And since that activity, it's clearly corporate in that we speak to one another. Okay, it's clearly he's talking about something corporate because we're speaking to one another. Its primary referent undoubtedly is the community gathered for worship. So he says, instead of these guys over here, that's not how you're to be. You are, when you gather together, you're to be filled with the Spirit, an expression of which is your singing these religious songs. Spirit-transformed people expressing their hearts to God instead of drunk people over here practicing debauchery. Look at the shift. Look at the contrast. Here's what the Lincoln says. The spirit-filled living will manifest itself in their corporate worship as they address and edify one another by means of all the types of songs the Spirit inspires, as they sing their praise of Christ from the heart, and as they in Christ's name offer thanksgiving to their God and Father for all the blessings He has bestowed upon them. Do you see what is going on when we assemble? I understand that we... But when we assemble... As the community of God, gathered together, one body, and together we are expressing our praise to God. And we act like, you know, no, it's just kind of a, you know, we come here as a religious duty kind of thing. Do you see the dynamic of what's going on in our assembly as we gather? Spirit-transformed hearts, filled with the Spirit, praising God for what He's done. The community of redeemed people at His feet, praising Him. Oh, this is big, good. And we have to see it, but we're doing it from our hearts. Hearts that are expressing, singing to God as a body of people, saying to God, thank you, thank you, wonderful. Nobody like you. And as we sing our praises to God, as we offer that heartfelt praise and thanks to God in song, so we also communi communicate with each other through that praise and thanksgiving. And in that we build each other up, right? As we are sitting here singing praises to God, thanking Him for who He is, we are all in on that. We are speaking, we are all participants, we are all hearing that. We are speaking to one another through what we are saying to God in our praise. And we are building each other up. Wonderful. Right? We're singing all of these things to God. And what does it do for us? It strengthens us, builds us. We incorporate those messages and say, Man, God is great. No God like Him. Anywhere. Bought me. I'm worthless. He saved me. All right, do you see what that does to the body? And we're doing this from our hearts. We have to be involved in this. We have to, as a body of people, be saying to God, listen, we appreciate you, love you. And that's part of the idea of the purity of the body. Because you can't have people tolerated who are sitting here saying, listen, I don't care what God wants me to do, as in the situation Bill mentioned. I'm just going to live with my girlfriend. Okay, I'm, just, I'm not talking just about living, you know. It's what I'm doing when I'm living there. Okay, well then, what's the, how is that person, their expressions of devotion? Are, so, see, we are together from our hearts praising God and singing glory to Him. Ascribing glory to Him. Our gatherings, as I said, the contrast couldn't be sharper. Not alcohol-fueled exercises in debasement. Expressions of spirit-transformed hearts to the glory of God. What's happened to us? Why are we doing this? Because God has reached down and changed us that we as a group of people now sit here and praise Him. The world looks at us and says, what are the crazy people wasting their time? Because we have been changed by God. And we're expressing our devotion to Him. All right, let me introduce this. 5, 21 to 24. Uh, he says, Submit to one another in fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is head of the wife as Christ also head of, is head of the church. He himself being savior of the body. But as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives are to submit to the husbands in everything. 
Now, verse 21, this could be translated as a continuation. Well, first, it, it introduces, it, it's an introduction to the relationships, this section dealing with the relationships in the ancient household, okay, where we have husbands, wives, parents, children, masters, servants, slaves. Okay, he's going to talk about this, so he's introducing this section that's dealing with the uh, relationships in the ancient household, and it could be translated as a continuation of the sentence that began in 518. Okay, I'm just, this is kind of like a little footnote for, for you technical nerds. Okay, it, it could be translated that way from 518, you could, you could carry it on, but the standard Greek, the, the standard, uh, Greek text that you have, they put a period after 520, and they start a new paragraph at 521. Okay, they, they do that, and here's what John Muddeman says about that in his commentary. So I, that's how I'm following it, and I think that makes sense. Muddeman says, the verb is a participle, this verb submit, okay, which is translated as a command. There's a reason for that, but it's really a participle, literally submitting. He said, the verb is a participle used in place of an imperative, in place of a command, and not uncommon idiom in a series of ethical exhortations. It is grammatically possible in the absence of any particle indicating the beginning of a new sentence to see this verse, 521, as the completion of the series of participles in the preceding sentence, speaking, singing, chanting, and giving thanks, submitting. Okay, so you could translate it as just a carry on of that same sentence. He says, however, the doxological phrase at the end of verse 20 makes a satisfactory closure and would surely force the reader to draw breath for a new paragraph. And in terms of content, 521 changes the subject and forms an introduction to the section that follows. So I'm, I'm tuned into the possibility that people want to translate this to a number of commentators just as a carry-on. But following the standard Greek text in this reasoning, I think it makes sense to put the period there and start a new paragraph and take this, take this uh, participle as a command. Okay, so if you're looking and saying, why did he do that? That's why he did it. Okay, and there are a number of translations that, follow, that would follow that way. Now the command to... To submit to one another, this is all, I, I, well, I got about two minutes. Let me say this, and I got a lot to say on this, okay? I have a lot to say about, about women and uh, wives to husbands, and I got a lot to say to husbands. Uh, and I'm going to say it all. <laughs> but I can't in two minutes, okay? But let me just say, one of the things here, this command of submit to one another I think we've gotten off on a, a bad foot here a lot of times with this. It's often understood as a command for mutual or reciprocal submission. A command that, you know, person A submit to person B and person B submit to person A. You see this idea. And I, don't th I think that's a misunderstanding. Okay, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think that, that with a number of commentators, I think Paul is urging the Christians to submit to those to whom they owe submission the specific focus being on the need of wives to submit to the husbands, children to submit to the parents, and slaves to submit to the masters. Okay, now that doesn't mean that, there, that the duties owed by husbands to wives, parents to children, masters to slaves are unimportant. It just means, I think, that is, those duties are not fairly characterized as submission. Okay? Uh, like I said, I have more to say about this. The verb that's rendered submit, it doesn't mean to be humble or to act in a thoughtful, considerate, or serving way. It means to yield to the leadership right of another. Let me read to you what the Peter O'Brien says. This word, it regularly functions to describe the submission of someone in an ordered array to another who was above the first, that is, in authority over that person. Further, none of the relationships where this verb appears is reversed. Husbands are not told to be subject to their wives, nor parents to children, nor the government to citizens, nor disciples to demons. The word does not describe a symmetrical relationship, since it always has to do with an ordered relationship in which one person is over and another under. In this sense, the term is not mutual in its force. Now, having left you with that, you'll be scratching your head. What I'm, what I'm saying to you is, is that it is a mistake to take these duties and understand them as submission. There are duties of a husband, duties of parents, duties of masters, but I think it is not right to understand those duties as submission. You say, well, why does it say submit to one another? Okay, when we come back next week, Lord willing, I will show you how one another doesn't always mean reciprocal. Like when he says they're trampling one another. Do you think that means they trampled somebody and the people who were trampled got up and trampled on them? It means some trampling others in the group. And I think that's the focus, but I got more to say about that and I may have left you scratching your head. Thanks.